And in this session, Gerald Toy will walk us through the new tool, explain the legislative background behind the tool, and discuss further benefits. Our speaker, um, Gerald, heads up the University Center for Information Policy, which aims to guide the university's response to information related legislation. And in addition to its information management policy, training and awareness efforts, the center houses our institutional De deputy information offices under the Protection of Personal Information Act and Promotion of Access to Information Act. Gerald is a seasoned technology and information governance professional with a particular interest in privacy, freedom of information, resilience and security. And Gerald and his team aim to make privacy more accessible and understood, and I like this, at less scary, with a focus on managing risk with maximizing the benefits of good practices rather than a pure compliance focus. Um, I'm, heading over, I'm handing over now to Gerald, who um, informs me that he doesn't mind questions during his presentation and would really like to engage with all of you here. So please feel free to use the chat um, or raise your hand whenever you have a question. Thank you, Gerald, and we are all really looking forward to this session. Thanks, Hanley. I'm just going to take over and share my screen. OK, I've got a short presentation prepared, followed by a few practical exercises we can do together. And we should have lots of time for questions and answers afterwards. Briefly, Hanley, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm Jaral. I am our university's deputy information officer under the Protection of Personal Information Act and Promotion of Access to Information Act. So that's for PIA and PIA. Before joining the university, I worked at a big four accounting firm focused on technology risk advisory. And before that, I worked as an SAP consultant with a focus on uh, human capital management. I also happen to be a certified data privacy solutions engineer, but most importantly, I'm not a lawyer. And the reason that I've this little introduction slide is I want to illustrate that privacy isn't its own special discipline that exists in isolation. Rather, privacy requires a myriad of views and disciplines working together in an integrated manner to actually give effect to the right to privacy. Our legislation itself, for example, explicitly calls out information and cybersecurity requirements, but we don't practice security because what Pierre tells us to do it. Security requirements have existed decades before Papier. For example, traditionally information security is about three things. Uh, the first being confidentiality of information, so preventing unwanted access. It's been about integrity of information, so that's protecting information against unwanted edits. And it's about availability of information, protecting information against unwanted loss. So we implement good security because we want the peace of mind that if we were to spill coffee on our laptops, our work could still continue. We would still have a way to recover from a coffee spill, something as simple as that. And those practices extend into other scenarios. So if you can recover from a coffee spill, it's likely you can cover from the loss of your laptop through theft or damage. And as a happy byproduct, it also aids with compliance with privacy. So that's what we're going to start off with. We're going to focus on what are the real risks actually. And I'm going to talk about the value of information. Then I'm going to give a brief legislative background. I'm going to describe how Stellenbosch University starts. I'm going to focus on your responsibilities, and then we're going to get into the practical of things. Now, unfortunately, privacy legislation is so broad, and as I mentioned, in, in cases, a, a host of different disciplines that I cannot touch on every aspect of privacy in this short session. 
But on my last slide, I have a, a handy link to a set of resources that we can use. And those resources are constantly being updated. And I did notice that our session is being recorded. And during this discussion, you'll see I'll talk about something that has just moved, has just shifted from late last year and is requiring us as a university to make a response. So those viewing the recording, please be aware of the date of this recording and always refer to our website, last slide that you'll see, uh, where you'll see the latest updates and changes. And into the real risk. So the real risk isn't about not having a perfect privacy policy or having it up to date. That will get you a slap on the wrist from auditors. One of the real risks, however, are data breaches. And one of the questions I have for the audience, you don't need to, you don't need to out yourselves now, but I want you to ask for yourself, do you ever reuse your password anywhere? Say, for example, you've got your university password that you use to access your university account, but you have maybe a personal email address, Gmail, for example. You might have a banking profile. You might be on LinkedIn. You might have bought movie tickets once online. And each of those services may have required that you have a password. Now, the question is, do you use the same password at multiple services? Every year, IBM Security runs a study uh, to analyze the cost of data breaches. And last year, they the breaches surveyed last year amongst those, nearly a fifth of those were attributed to stolen or compromised credentials. In 2021, it was 20% of all breaches. Now, one cyber attack you may have heard of is called credential stuffing. That is when a cyber when a malicious user has access to a breached data set on one side, and that breached data set has an email address and a password combination exposed. An attacker can use that combination and try to log into other services using the same details. If you have then used the same password on multiple services, the attacker can likely gain access. And if they can gain access to your, your primary email address, well, that means everything is compromised because nearly all services have a, I forgot my password option. Right at the end of the session, as part of our practicals, we're gonna have a, I'm gonna show you how you can check if your password and username combinations have ever been compromised. So a handy little check that we can practice at the end, which may feed some of our discussion during the Q&A session. But I want you to keep this in mind for now. The way our division and our team thinks about the value of information is not in terms of the value that this could be used to contribute towards research. We like to think from the mindset of a malicious user. So I have a question for the audience. What could you do with an email address? If you if you're a malicious user and the only thing you had was an email address, there is a, a slight clue in the in the picture. But what would be the only thing you could do? What not the only thing? What could you do with an email address? Or at the simplest, you could you could spam people. Unsolicited direct marketing. You could do that. But if you were to look at how our email addresses are structured, you'll notice that our university addresses have a, a sun.ac.za domain. And with a very little bit of research, an attacker can quickly figure out, oh, that belongs to a, a specific university. And they can then craft more uh, interesting attacks. They can attempt to fish. And with a little bit more information and context, they could even spearfish. And now many of our departments and faculties and, and past environments are very guilty of the next one. CEO fraud. This is a very interesting attack where the attacker pretends to be somebody of seniority within an organization, hence the name CEO fraud. 
and they pretend to be the senior individual. And then they send an email attack, in, in some cases, uh, to a more junior employee with an instruction. And if the employee follows that instruction, that normally leads to some sort of compromise. Now, the reason I say our departments and faculties and past environments are a bit guilty here is because on our on our websites, we often put down our organizational structure. This is the dean of our faculty. This is the faculty manager. These are their assistants. Uh, we do the same for past environments. This is the director. This is this. These are the people reporting to the director, etc. And we give attackers the information required to enrich their attack. But this doesn't mean we shouldn't post those those structures on our website. There are many very good reasons why we need to have that level of accessibility and transparency. There are good reasons why students need to know who they can contact within admin a in certain circumstances there are lots of good reasons why we need to to put that information out but why we put that information out needs to be questioned and how we put that out needs to be challenged so it's not a poppy what i'm trying to show you is poppy is not necessarily about what we put out and what we work with it's more about how and why so in this situation when we have a divisional org chart on the website with email addresses, et cetera, exposed to the general internet. The individuals that are looking after those inboxes, they need to have extra training about the different types of attacks they, that they might suffer. The procedures that they put in place to handle incoming emails need to be robust enough for that to and give them the space to think is this a legitimate instruction or not but so poppy isn't that you can't do research on topic a or topic b it's more about how are you doing it why are you doing it okay Just to summarize our, the way we consider information within our team. Basically, if information can be used to do harm, the more harm it can do, the more valuable the information. And the more easily harm can be done, the more valuable the information. And once we have this view of the information we're working with, we can start building the appropriate controls and mechanisms to to ensure or to enable a more secure and privacy respectful processing. Now, very briefly, the legislative background behind impact assessments. Internationally, almost all countries at the very least discuss privacy and their equivalent of the Bill of Rights. But there are some specific pieces of legislation abroad that may have an impact on us here in South Africa. And probably one of the biggest ones in the context of our university is the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. If you're engaging with European partners, for example, their expectation is more strongly leans to compliance with their regulation than Papia. There are some differences between the two. Then at a national level, we have POPIA, as I mentioned, but we also have the Promotion of Access to Information Act. That act it allows a, an individual to request information from an organization, but that act has built-in considerations when such requests may need to be refused or they may need to be trimmed down a bit. And that is when the, the records requested include the information of natural persons. And as a sector, University South Africa or USAF, a few years back, they developed a guideline for all public universities in South Africa. And this year, they're going to be looking at revising that guideline, which has a lot of recommendations of how universities should and can consider privacy compliance. Then more recently, the Academy of Science of South Africa is developing a code of conduct under POPIA for the research sector. And codes of conduct are an interesting aspect of our legislation. 
A code allows a sector working together with the regulator, the information regulator, to clarify the application of the act within that sector. So the Academy of Science is looking at a code of conduct that clarifies for peer in terms of research conducted within South Africa involving uh, participants that would be considered data subjects, that is the term used in Popia, as data subjects under Popia. The code has gone through several rounds of commentary and was submitted to the regulator about three weeks ago for approval. The regulator, after their internal review, will make the code available for public commentary, and after a phase of public commentary, the regulator will decide whether or not to approve the code. If the code is approved, it becomes part of our legislative universe as researchers. So not only will we need to consider Papier for research done here in South Africa, not only will we have to consider the GDPR when working with European partners, but we will also have to consider the code. And if you go back to my opening statements about the recordings of the session, this is an example of where things might change very quickly in our space. Last year, the code was in draft, but this year the code is with the regulator and next year the code might be in play. So we need to keep up, keep up to date to ensure that we're working with the most relevant materials. And then locally, we have our institutional requirements as well. We have a privacy regulation. The first version was released in 2019 and a revised version was launched last year. And we can summarize our privacy regulation on one slide. Essentially what we aim to do was to distill the, the principles within Popia into more actionable and more uh, easily understood language for for the institution. So number one, we ask that everybody recognize, understand, and respond appropriately to the value of the information we plan to process. And that's where our impact assessment methodology is gonna help us a lot. Number two, we expect our people to recognize and understand and respond appropriately to the different justifications for the lawful processing of personal information. You might think, or you may have heard, that Papier is all about consent. But if you think about consent, that can be very, very difficult to manage consent. For example, if it is truly informed, voluntary consent, somebody must be able to withdraw their consent. But many processes break down with the withdrawal of consent. And that is why our Act allows for more options than just consent. However, in the research context, consent is probably still going to be your, 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 your go-to, but I'm going to give you an example of another one. For those of us employed by the university, every month the university processes some of our personal information in order to pay our salaries and our wages. They process some banking information, they process some identifiable identifiers, etc in order to make the payment. But the university doesn't need to ask us our consent for this every every month. Imagine if somebody had to withdraw their consent to being paid or forgot to provide their consent in time to be paid. It makes for some awkward situations. Rather, that processing is governed by our employment agreements with the university, so our employee contracts with the university. That provides the justification to process our banking information in that way. So there are there are a host of options available. More in more detail that we can discuss in the questions if you like, Q&A session, but definitely on our website we have more guidance on these others. Then back to our regulation number three, process only what you need to process to meet your goal. Think back to my image of the fish. 
when we have very little information, all we can do is send a spam. We can send out spam. But as we get to enrich our, our, our information, we can make more sophisticated attacks. And one way to protect against those more sophisticated attacks is to never enable that enrichment. So we, we don't over collect. We don't collect just because it might be handy. We, we only collect what we absolutely need. Number four, it's all about security. Remember, I spoke about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Our law just happens to mention quality. They don't explicitly say integrity. But if you're familiar with security standards, you're familiar with the concept of integrity. So remember, protecting against unwanted access, unwanted edits, and unwanted loss. Then number five, we need to be transparent. And uh, a good rule of thumb I like to use here is we should limit the surprise factor. Our research participants should not be surprised when we reach out to them. They not, should not be surprised when they find out what we've been doing with their information. That surprise can be a very negative experience. So to limit that surprise effect, we are transparent and open about what we're doing. And number six, we need to know what to do in case of an information breach. And I'll get to that in a bit. Then from that, from our regulation, we also have a set of responsibilities. So number one is take steps to protect your own personal information. Now I go back to the credential stuffing example. If you if you are using the same password email combination for where you store your your research data and your social media accounts and your social media account gets breached so it's your personal information gets breached that can be used to breach all of your research data as well so in taking steps to protect our own personal information we are also taking steps to protect the personal information of others. And one of the things I, I, I like to do as part of the job, or rather one of the things I just like to do in general is go to a coffee shop. And very often coffee shops in South Africa, not just in Stellenbosch, you'll often find laptops, mobile devices left unattended, unlocked while the owner quickly goes to the bathroom or quickly goes to the counter to order another coffee. And in that moment, anything could happen to that laptop or mobile device. It could be stolen. Somebody could maliciously change your wallpaper. Right. So we need to take steps to protect our own information and in doing so we're protecting the information of others. So it's a big focus on our personal strategies and our personal security. That goes to number three, is to contribute to conversations about privacy. In fact, about all our policies for that matter. One nice thing about the most recent version of the ASAF code is that we can see our input as, as a division directly in that code. We can see the feedback we gave to the drafting team and the lead author was taken into consideration and pulled into that document. Last year, we, we organized a workshop where we invited people to contribute to our input into, into what can be our legislation. And you'll often see in our newsletters, we will in the, I'm sorry, in the institutional newsletters, we often take up space there, highlighting when there are such opportunities. And I really do encourage you to, to consider that. And number four, if you suspect a breach, please report a breach. Very briefly, I'm gonna introduce you to impact assessments and show you how it ties back to everything else we've discussed. Then we'll get to the practicals and then to the Q&A. Impact assessments, they're known as data protection impact assessments abroad, but because our legislation refers to personal information, we call them personal information impact assessments. Within our team, we sometimes call them privacy impact assessments. They're a bit 
easier to uh, to say. Impact assessments have been defined internationally. It's less uh, our our regulator hasn't yet defined it as explicitly as our European counterparts have. So within Europe, they they argue that these impact assessments they are used to describe the processing of personal information. They assess the necess necessity and proportionality of it, and they help manage the risks involved with the information processing, and they help old compliance and demonstrate compliance. And we've developed a tool to to help us identify if we need to run an impact assessment for our research. If certain South African specific elements of the legislation trigger for our research. Also to help us identify the value of the information we, we want to process. And where to go next if you require additional information. And as part of our practical, we'll run through the preliminary report together. However, as of last month, there are some changes. And I've extracted this from the ASAP code of conduct that went to the regulator. And one of the big questions we've had since the start as a sector is, who does the impact assessment? Because it's not necessarily that easily executed by somebody who is not used to working with within information security, cyber security, uh, within business continuity, business resilience, within the law. If somebody is studying in a direction where they've never been exposed to these matters, becomes very difficult for them to run such an assessment. But the question was, can we can we put it this burden on our RECs? Can we expect the RECs to play this role? Another option was, can the deputy information officer of an organization do that? Unfortunately, in, in our institution, we currently only have one deputy information officer, that's me. And I could not possibly see to every research project that needs an impact assessment. So in the current draft that has gone to the regulator for approval, ASAF have positioned that we need to build our impact assessment methodology into our policies, procedures, or any other binding rules that might apply to our researchers. And that the researchers themselves perform the impact assessment. But there needs to be some layer of approval or oversight over the quality of those. That might be the deputy information officer, so that might be me. It might be the RECs. So over the semester break, this is what our division is going to be tackling with, with the aim to launch a revised tool for next semester that covers this adequately. And that's why I said we've got to keep an eye on what's changing, what's moving. And I hope that some of you will also contribute to this discussion as well. As promised, some resources. We have a one-stop shop, sun.ac.za slash privacy. You'll find our regulation there. You'll find our impact assessment tools there. You'll find guidance notes. We have internal guidance notes, and we also provide links to the sector resources such as the USAF materials. You can request training for your, your environment, and we can even help you with full impact assessments. Now, certain European partners require full impact assessments, so we can help you run those if needed. And then finally, we also have uh, the, the mechanism for reporting potential information breaches there too. And now be, while I change screens to to our impact assessment tool to, to guide us through the practical, while I do that, I have another exercise that you may consider running for yourself right now. So we're all online. Consider opening a new tab in your browser and we can Check if we've ever been compromised. Remember credential stuffing? 
Now I've listed a few services on screen. They range from, from the free on the one side to the browser plugin to the enterprise solution. Easy to find if you hop into your favorite search engine. Uh, mine is DuckDuckGo if you're interested. And what these services do is that they collect and index breach data sets. And then they make them searchable. So within these within these tools, you can put in a, an email address, for example. And if that email address has ever been caught in one of their index breaches, the service will report that back to you. The service will also tell you what was breached, what is the impact of the breach, when did it happen, and what you can maybe do about that breach. A good example is, let's say a credit card has been compromised, and it's been a recent compromise. The potential impact is that there are fraudulent purchases made using your credit card information. And something you can do about that is to contact your bank and cancel your card. And they have similar descriptions for the other fields that might be compromised. <laughs> me. Such as what does it mean if a password was compromised? So while I'm busy changing, changing uh, screens, take a few minutes, open a new browser tab uh, and give some of these a try. If you're feeling brave, Put down in the chat where you've been compromised. It always makes for good discussion. I know from a student perspective for our students on board, uh, Canva, for example, was compromised once. That's an interesting compromise to consider. And also don't worry, the more sensitive breaches, these tools have interesting approaches to multi-factor authentication. So for a very sensitive breach, you also need to prove that you're the owner of the email address that you're checking. So you won't be able to quickly see if a parent or a partner or a child or a friend has been caught in a particularly embarrassing breach that you can't do. But for the, let, let's say, the less embarrassing, but by no means less um, impactful breaches, uh, you can run a, a search right now. And please do share and just give me a moment to change screens to our impact assessment tool. There we've got a Twitter breach. All right, this on screen now is our preliminary personal information impact assessment. This was Gino? launched. Sorry, yes. I'm here. Yes, um, can I ask you something before you move on to the to the tool? Sure. It's a very basic question, but if you okay. can get back to your image of, of the fish. Okay. I would like to know what's the difference between the the fish and spearfish. Okay, let me go back to that. Thank you. Okay, fish is back on screen. No. Fish, yes, fish with a pH. Yes. Fish with fish with a pH. <laughs> the 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 fish or your fish fish. <laughs> <laughs> so fish with a pH. Uh, a simple one is all right. I know that this is a sun.ac.za address, and I can see in the news there's something topical about Stellenbosch University. All right, uh, we're in the news this year for reason A, B, and C, we were in the news last year. We can go back a decade and we can see why we were in the news back then as well. And so a fish would be something general, but in our context, bolt around that scenario. Let's go a few years back and, and let's say this is something about roads must fall, fees must fall. So we know contextually there's that happening and we know that these addresses belong to Stellenbosch University. So our attack would be something that would bring something from that context of fees must fall into the attack email. 
A spearfish, on the other hand, is when we we know more about the individuals. So the fish was in general. You might be a Standard Bank in, uh, customer, so we will send you a mail that looks like it comes from Standard Bank. The spearfish, on the on the other hand, would would know a bit more about me to enrich that attack. So they wouldn't just say dear customer, they might say dear Jarrell. Right, so a fish might say, in our context, they say dear student, but a spearfish might actually have our name and would be something more topical as well to, to lure you into to clicking on the uh, attack link or, or poisoned attachment. So it's about how let's call it localized or specialized the attack is or specific the attack is. I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. All right. Oh, I see there's a Deezer breach. Uh, Hanley, I see that you've been pwned as well. I've been pwned, yes. Okay, let me see. Last breach was in 2019. Un unfortunately, that does not mean you're safe uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, Poppy still includes all information that came into existence before Poppy went live. So from a Poppy perspective, uh, this is important for us as researchers, researchers to, to, to take note of. Just because we're doing secondary research on information that came into existence in 2015 doesn't mean that Poppy doesn't apply. Right? So that, that's one thing about time. But also, some information doesn't age out. Uh, for example, uh, um, a telephone number may age out. You might change service providers. But your ID number, it is unlikely to change. So even if the last breach you were in was in 2019, if that breach included static, let's call it more static information rather than transactional, then, then you may still be exposed on that side. Uh, globally, some of the more fascinating breaches uh, um, happen the initial compromise happens years before the actual attack. And for those who are interested, uh, I think it was Greenish. They have an interesting historical data breach that you can easily find on your search engine that talks about data taken from the early 2000s and then exploited last decade. Ah, here we have a quick question about uh, withdrawing consent. What happens when a participant wishes to withdraw consent? Well, that depends on what your informed consent form said. So if you said, if you used our template verbatim, which says you can withdraw with no harm or consequences, etc., to you, then you must withdraw them. That is the agreement you made with the research participant. There are ways to future-proof consent forms going forward and uh, identify different mechanisms to to limit your exposure to such events. But based on your the nature of your research, that's not always going to be possible. Unfortunately, I hope it hasn't happened to you. All right, let's go back to the tool. OK, as I mentioned, this tool is set to change in the next three to four months. As I go through it, I'll highlight where those changes are likely to come in. But to reiterate, the idea behind this tool is to help you figure out how valuable your information is. And once you have that understanding of value, you can then, you can then design better controls to go along with it. Your controls must meet the, the the risk and the value of the information involved. So that's the primary purpose of this. But it, this tool is also designed to help you identify uh, when you may need to do a full impact assessment, and it may and also helps you identify when you have may have other legislative requirements. 
first page is a brief introduction with the relevant definitions. And over here, we have the screening. Do you need an impact assessment? On our website, we have this available. So those who are there now, you can download it right now. This is the fillable version. You'll also see we have a link to an online version. Uh, that one we're going to retire soon. We launched that a good few years back, but over over time we realized that we did too much of the thinking for our our users, and it made it too easy to to value their information, and there was not much room uh, inviting critical thought about the information that they wanted to work with. All the calculations were automated, etc. So we've taken a step back for this version and made it a bit old school and more manual with the hope that people engage more closely with the material. But we're going to experiment and we're going to see what happens and our new revision in four months, might we might go back to that uh, old version. But we'll see. And your feedback is also most welcome. I'm going to use an example now as we talk through this. I'm going to say our example is I am buying a movie ticket online, right? Or I am the owner of the website through which movie tickets are sold. And in my context, there is a new payment options have emerged. So I am running an impact assessment or thinking about an impact assessment because there are some changes going on. And perhaps because of those changes, I am migrating to new technology at the same time. And with all these new payment options, there might be a third party involved as well. So these are the reasons I'm doing that. This list we've discovered, we need to update um, based on the latest version of the ASF code and based on investigations by our colleagues in IT into cloud platforms. So we are going to update this list with more scenarios. But let's go with these for now. I own a, a website that sells movie tickets. There are new payment options coming online, which brings new technologies and new third parties. And on this page, now we get into the actual assessment. We've, we've crafted these as simple yes, no questions. It's very important to note that this is we're focusing on the inherent risk. So the, the risk and value of the information before any controls are considered at the point of collection. So there's no opportunity to do fancy de-identification or anything yet, right? At the point of collection. So are we working with the personal information of children? Uh, in this context, we're probably not. Are we working with special personal information? Our act identifies certain types of information that are considered of, of higher value and is defined as special personal information. Children also have a, legally they cannot provide consent in the same way that somebody over 18 can. And that's why working with their information is also considered of, of a slightly riskier nature. But in this case, movie tickets, I'm not asking about philosophical beliefs. I'm not requiring fingerprints, et cetera, to sell a movie ticket. So it's a no. But are we working with unique identifiers? Thankfully for us, our regulator has defined what a unique identifier is, and we have some examples on screen right now. But I would, in selling a movie ticket, I would need a contact detail so that I can send proof of payment, confirmations, etc. So we will have a cell phone or an email address. We will have a reference number as well. We'll also have an account number from the payment mechanism. So with that in mind, one thing you'll notice missing from the list is name and surname. Now my name and surname might be fairly unique. But there are many others, the name surname combination is not so unique. All right, so if you're just working with name and surname, 
you might be with a slightly lower value of information, but not that low. All right, anyway, back to this. We are working with unique identifiers. Let's say yes. Are we going to, at the point of information, is the information anonymous? In this case, it's not. Now, anonymity isn't necessarily that easy to do. Now, if we were in the library auditorium doing this, I, I have a little exercise I like to do to illustrate anonymity. I'm going to try it online. All right, so I start off with everybody raising their hands. Okay. And then as I make statements, people need to drop their hands. So my first statement could be, uh, I who is not a South African citizen? Everybody who's not a South African citizen, drop their hand. Then it will be, okay, everybody who's not South African born, drop their hand. Everybody who's not, who does not identify as male, drop their hand. Then I'll back to something like, everybody that does not identify as Asian, drop their hand. And uh, quite often, there aren't many people left with their hands raised. Sometimes it's just me. And that illustrates how, how uh, those fields that I've discussed might still render me identifiable within the context we're working within. So anonymity is not as easy as deleting a column in Excel. Right? And that's why we say if you're not sure, tick no. But in our movie ticket example, we're working with identifiers, it's a definite no. And then finally, are there any other considerations? Now, our legislation doesn't explicitly call out financial information, but I know working with payment information, etc. Yes, there's probably some other risk involved. And then very old school, we score ourselves. So no children, leave that as zero. No special information, leave that as zero. But it's identifiable, well, unique identifiers, i.e. not anonymous, and there might be contextual considerations. Gives us a score of seven. And then we score over here. So if we got a naught, poppy might not even apply. Poppy only applies to identifiable living individuals. So poppy might not even apply. If we only got a one, it's probably a low risk. But we advise, be sure. Uh, um, remember I did the exercise with raising hands? Consider running a similar exercise just to be sure that you haven't, that you, just to be sure that you've considered more than one angle when doing your assessment. Number, if you've got three or higher, well, we're probably working with special information or, or identified information or the information of children. So we'll need some extra controls to protect things there. And number four, the very high risk, special personal information. It is identifiable, etc. There is some significant contextual risk involved. Yeah, we have a very spe specific check. This is from our legislation. Uh, the regulator considers some types of information processing as particularly high risk. So high risk that you need to reach out to the regulator before you even start to ask for permission. And this process can take, I think, 17 weeks, the regulator said. So the earlier that you catch this consideration, the better for your, your research time. Our next steps. This is going to be our biggest change for our, our relaunch next semester based on the extracts I showed you from the ASAF code. So who's going to do things? Who's available to help? But let me say for right now, if you've got a high risk project, you can come to our team and we'll help you. We will help you right now and we probably will still offer that service going forward as well. But we will refine this next steps page based on our review, a full review of the updated SF code. And that's it for the 
planned presentation part. Happy to tackle questions now. Thank you so much for a very informative session. I really you opened my eyes for taking steps to protect our own personal um, mm. information. Definitely, absolutely. And also for the fact that reusing your own password um, is a risk for uh, a possible data breach. I really mm. didn't thought of it like that. Um, we still have about five minutes, so this is a really good time management here. And we would really encourage anyone to use this opportunity. If you have any questions, um, please use the chat or raise your hand and let's use this five minutes that we have for any questions. I see a question in the chat about the slides. I will send the slides to you, Hanley, and you can distribute them. That we would really appreciate that. Thank you. If there's if there's no questions, um, you're more than welcome to us. I see there's a hand, and you're more than welcome. Um, just unmute yourself and please do go ahead and ask your question. Um, good morning. My name is Lulu Amne, and I'm from the Center for Medical Ethics and Law. Um, so I have a um, just a sort of a comment around uh, the unique identifier referred to in the form. So um, uh, in most of our research, we use um, unique identifiers for uh, for research participants. So we give them a study mm. specific unique identifier. And, I, and, and I, when I was listening to your presentation, I thought maybe just to clarify that people don't confuse those two identifiers, the study specific one and the one required by Popia. Just a comment. Thank you. Uh, Great presentation. Lulu. Thanks, Lulu. Um, We've we've been we visited each other on a few times at the centers, um, and that is a fantastic question because in this instance, that research participant number, that that reference number, it becomes the control. And if you were to search for the literature on this type of control, you would look for something like called pseudonymization, right, mm -hmm. or tokenization. So that is a security practice where you still want to be able to recognize a unique individual, but you want to scramble some of their identifiers so that if your data set is breached, mm -hmm. the, the attacker isn't stuck with identified information. Right. So you, you, you're applying a pseudonym or a token. Mm -hmm. uh, depend, uh, tokenization you'll find more on payment card strategies and pseudonymization you'll find more from a European guidance point on how to do this. But this is a practice being done for decades within research. And I think it's a good example of how privacy, good practices from, from other disciplines help you with your privacy compliance. So this, this is a good example of a good practice that has existed for decades. Many of us on, on the call today have probably do this. And it is a fantastic way to protect the pseudonymized information. The only risk remains is if you provide, if you maintain a key that links the pseudonym back to the original information. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, a very strict reading of the European guidance on that, that means it doesn't count as anonymous any, because you have a, you have a way to reverse it, even if you've hyper secured that key for reversal. Uh, you can't say your information is anonymous, un unfortunately, because if it was, uh, privacy legislation often doesn't apply then, but because you maintain the, the key, you, you can't claim anonymity. Uh, sorry, it was a bit of a rambly answer, but uh, if you want more information, you can you can look for tokenization or pseudonymization. Mm -hmm. Right, those are the great strategies to apply, um, and that will lower your residual risk. So your inherent risk might still be low, high, but your residual risk will be a lot lower if you work in that space. Um, apologies if that was a bit rambly, but those keywords, they should put you out to some great resources. Um, thank, you, thank you so much. There's another question in the chat from Ms. Stein who wants to know what is the best way to store passwords, especially if you create different passwords? So everybody has their own strategy. I can tell you what works for me, but then there are uh, tools called password managers that you can also explore. Um, 
So what works for me is that I only have a small core of services that require regular logging or require uh, or are so special that they require something unique. There's only a small handful. And so I only need to manage that small handful mentally. I don't need to manage every other service because many other services you create an account once to access a document. So for example, I to access the IBM report I reference, I needed to, that once. So I will generate a completely random string and use that once off. I also have um, a, a duck email address which sits in between my email address and the and the service. So that also add, adds another layer of protection. But that's how, that's how I handle it. Uh, it, it. My approach is very dystopian. I, I remember no passwords uh, because the forgot password option is there. Uh, but if many people, they use password managers. Um, I can tell you what not to do. That's no post. It's don't write it down. <laughs> don't put it in a text file on your desktop, etc. Those are the, the no no's. Those we can agree on. But what is best, that varies. Hey, we have a satisfied client there, and I see there's another hand. Please unmute yourself, and we still have time for this last question. Hello. Hi. No, I, I think he has just responded now because I wanted to say I'm one of the people who doesn't use uh, one password, but uh, with the Google option, I store my password so that I can just remember once I log into uh, my account. Now I wanted to ask what could be the danger, and then you have just answered that you are also one of them that you can't remember all the passwords and uh, you kind of store uh, your passwords. But I thought there could be a danger as well. All right. So if you if you're concerned about a password manager being breached. That's uh, the same sort of concern with any service being breached. And what I'd recommend in in choosing your password manager is to. To see this, this might take a bit more. If you're not a security nerd already, you might need to trust on the reviews of others. But these services often explain how they store their information. So if they're breached, uh, how that still how they store it still limits the damage. Uh, it can get very technical. I can talk for hours on passwords, but we only have a minute, so I, I won't. So what I advise here is, um, like, perhaps if you're considering buying a car, for example, that level of research you put into selecting your car, you can put the same sort of effort into your password management solution. And I advise you to go and see those expert reviews and even look at password management services that have been breached and how they handled the breach. That will give you a good clue if you can trust them or not. Gerald, thank you so much. I think maybe we must consider to include in next year's Research Library Week program a session on passwords, <laughs> uh, since it's so important and all of us are struggling with the same sort of problems. Um, I really want to thank you for a very informative session and we really appreciate your time and for taking part in our research program. And we will definitely keep up to date with Stellenbosch University's privacy regulation, especially regarding recordings of team sessions, so that we can stay up to date with that for all our training sessions and next year's library research week as well. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate all of your attendance as well and for participating and the engagement and all the questions. Thank you all for taking part in this first session. I hope to would join from um, some other sessions as well and that we'll see you there as well. Thank you all and enjoy the research week. Bye. Bye.